Trump is dead. Did you just say that voting is ridiculous? No, I think voting is great, but if I have to choose between a douche and a turd, I just don't see the point. You don't see the point. Oh, you young people just make me sick. Stanley, do you know how many people died so you could have the right to vote? But Mama, I just don't think there's much of a difference between a douche and a turd. I, I don't care. You don't care. Wonderful. Beautiful. Hey, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hey, welcome back to Politically Homeless Streaming on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We want to welcome Peter Coffin to the Indie News Network. That's hey, thanks for having me. Wow, Peter Coffin and Indie ready? News Network. What is this, a crossover episode? I had to. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had to. <laughs> yeah, I guess it is. I guess, right yeah, I guess it is, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's really Those good. Those of you don't know, if uh, you're not already subscribed, um, Peter Coffin uh, is the author of uh, Very Important Docs. And if you haven't seen it already, the latest drop has been... Horseshoe Theory. I just had it up. Horseshoe Theory is right, but not how you think. Not how you think. Well, the reason why it's not how you think is because people make it about something completely different. They make it about how one is better than the other, uh, rather than bringing it down to material relationships and asking the question, what do these things physically actually represent? <laughs> so what's the what what was the what would you say what would you say was the main inspiration behind this? I I I, I did man, I did notice you mentioned um Aaron Bushnell and like Max Azarello and not. Yeah, I mean they were definitely a, a big part of it. Like I it did feel like there's a certain um, malaise that those types of people have, and they don't they aren't in a great uh, place. Uh, in terms of their lives, like we're in a society that's very set up to sort of prevent us from getting anywhere. There's um, alienation. There's a lot of people are very depressed. I talked about um, Mark Fisher as well. He tragically killed himself as well, but for not really a reason, just full depression. Like they, they both had reasons. Um, Maxwell Azarello posted a manifesto about it. Um, Aaron Bushnell posted a video of it actually happening. Uh, and and they, they were good reasons. Like, they were protesting the right things. It's just something that is ultimately not helpful for that cause. It takes their lives so they can't accomplish anything towards that cause. Um, it's not that I'm saying they're bad people. They certainly weren't. I would even argue that they were good people and cared about the right things in the world. But, I mean, that was part of the inspiration. Another part is, I don't know if anyone here has ever seen how I am uh, perceived by leftists in the world. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But it is not as a communist. Most of them think that I'm a covert fascist or a right winger or a racist or uh, any of those numbers of bigotry. And to be frank, uh, I argue with them and I'm like, you know what? Materially speaking, there are class interests at play and I don't really care about the left right thing. That seems to be distracting you from the thing that will get you to what you want, which, by the way, I'm not even against almost anything those people are for. I mean, I'm certain against, certainly against parts of them. Like, uh, I think that there are aspects of their ideology that I don't completely agree with. But I, I think that everybody should be able to say what they want, be what they want. Uh, that goes for identity. That goes for job. That goes for all of these things. And I think that's ultimately what they want. But they just, when I say it's a class issue, all of it is a class issue, they think I'm a class reductionist and somehow that makes me a Strasserite, which somehow makes me a Nazi and somehow makes me right wing. And I don't know. It's it's it, all of that stuff has led me to realize, you know, left and right are not material things. They're idealist things. If you go back to the French Revolution, they're material things because the left represents the left of the National Assembly, the bourgeoisie, the right represents uh, the feudal aristocracy, which their supporters were on the right side of the National Assembly. But ultimately, that side lost and was absorbed by the other side. Like when we talk about the bourgeoisie or the capitalist class now, we don't distinguish it by, I mean, we do when we're talking about certain things, but as a class, we don't distinguish it by if they own productive property or if they own land. Um, 
I mean, they're still bourgeoisie one way or the other because they're operating it in the capitalist mode. Uh, and so to me, that says, all right, the difference between left and right is ideals. And what do ideals do? They're usually an ideological excuse for the capitalist class to do what it wants to do, um, whether that is the woke mind virus, as they call it, or whatever the anti-woke mind virus is. I don't know what you call that, but it's also a mind virus. That's a definite thing. Um, these things don't progress any meaningful argument. They actually cement people into these seemingly different viewpoints, which ultimately put us at, um, you know, let's fight over whether something is good or bad until we're tired and then we sleep or kill ourselves. I, I like, yeah, I, yeah. I, really, I really enjoy how you tied it back to capital, uh, about preserving capital. Yeah. And, and breaking down the history. I mean, like, like, you know, if you haven't seen it yet, but um, a, an important thing you mentioned, the, the, con the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Yes, that's Would a big tie, part of it. Yeah, that, that, do you think you can tie a direct line between that and modern day wokeism because it like that kind of feels like the entry point of like uh of uh you know techno fashion like capitalists to come in and kind of like in invade the left space because i think they I, i'm not sure if that was like already problematic at the time well but, I mean, at the founding of the congress of cultural freedom i it, i i don't want to say that like what we would call woke existed then because it certainly didn't no, 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 no. That kind of um, concerned with only cultural issues. There was a left at that time that was that. It just wasn't the prominent left. It was uh, like the, so so the social Democrats, the um, the leftists that like uh, various sects of socialism that are more or less, you know, arguing for immediate spontaneous revolution stuff that is not going to just happen like without organizing or any of those things, uh, those segments ultimately existed and they were usually against Marxists, which Marxists going back a couple of decades before the Congress for cultural freedom gained prominence through the Soviet union rising to power and the Soviet union in a lot of ways functioned as a means to, I think, hold quote unquote, the left accountable, even though it's, you know, for certain ideals, the de, de facto like force against capitalism and all of the things that a leftist would say they don't like was the Soviet Union. So a lot of them kind of did defer to a class analysis. But as uh, the 40s and 50s progressed, there was kind of a change in the perception of what communism was. And it, they had been doing propaganda for a couple of decades specifically to like damage the reputation of that. But they really I think you can absolutely draw uh, a line directly from the Congress from cultural freedom to wokeism, because some of the larger promoters of wokeism include um, the Open Society Foundation, George Soros's uh, nonprofit. And if you trace the Congress for cultural freedom after it was abolished in, I think it was 67 um, because of being found out by The New York Times and exposed for being a CIA front. Uh, it formally detached from the CIA and became funded by the Ford Foundation. And eventually, uh, which it was calling itself, I think, the International um, something, I don't, International something for cultural. It still retained the name cultural freedom, but it wasn't uh, CIA affiliated at that point, at least not to anybody's knowledge currently. And that was absorbed in 1992 by the Open Society Foundation. So, I mean, I'm not saying that the Open Society Foundation created wokeness, uh, but it did propagate a lot of the ideologies that were developed in the 70s and 80s uh, by academics that sort of, in a lot of ways, you could call the beginnings of wokeness, um, intersectionality, um, aspects. Of, I say aspects of, but I mean queer theory. I, I'm not against queer people or trans people or anything, but queer theory I am against. I think that it is a very reductive and ultimately essentialist form of thinking no there was a, there was a definitely like a direct like uh intention to remove class from feminism i, I absolutely do yeah i i have to say um this um this stuff is like the ultimate like proletarian division sort of topic um i agree i i see people fighting over this all day and all night and 
that can't be by accident. I'm sorry. I'm too cynical. I'm too old too to think this is not like deliberate. And speaking to your point from earlier, we've we've gotten all the all the same labels too. You know. Yeah. You're not a you're you're not a real leftist unless you want to. I don't know, like wear a mask or or five billion gender. Like, there's so many qualifiers and check marks. I remember it. If you vote for George, I remember Trump, you're a Trump supporter. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I remember it specifically with the Rage Against the War Machine rally last year, and it was just like, it was just an avalanche of comrades who were just like doing everything they can to smear it based off these like little check marks and purity tests that people seem to fail or whatever. And it's like, this can't be accidental. There's no way this is accidental, especially no. as people's material conditions worsen. Um, you see people from different, you know, different uh, political leanings kind of organizing to stop things like, rampant imperialism or you know uh, i was old enough to remember occupy wall street they kind of deployed some of the same like smear tactics there yes it's just definitely. um like my a god it shouldn't too. what was that a genocide too right yeah now? nah whatever just uh, <laughs> i was gonna yeah. make that Who passed it? Who passed it? <laughs> yeah that's my favorite part is that this started argument. October 7th. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, definitely not before that. Don't look at anything before that. It just October 7th. And do you condemn hummus? That's the only yeah. two things we want to talk about. Um, <laughs> if you don't love that hummus. I just don't know. I don't know why you would even show up to dinner. I want yeah. to. I, 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 I did want to bring that up. I wanted to ask you, like, because we're we're 12 months into this. Uh, Gaza genocide. You know, I would, I would, I would view you know being pro Palestine as like traditionally like left. What you know, how I same at least if I, you're I, not mean, I think it is semitic like, If you're anti-Semitic, I would say you're probably not. You probably hate everybody in that area. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was, I was you're gonna say it's like, yeah, I was gonna say like there's one caveat, and that like there's a lot of those people who are taking the criticism of Israel and like coming out of the woodwork and they're, I, you're, you're just oh, like, man. wait, no, 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 no. We're not. Yeah. That, that's not what we mean. We're criticizing like Zionism in the state. And they're just like, see, I told you the Jews could <laughs> like, No, it's like, ben, it's like Dennis on always sunny in the, the blackface episode when he's like, I hate it when you're on my side. It's <laughs> <laughs> a great, stop it. We were, <laughs> so we're, we're we're twelve months into this, and we're we've seen weekend after weekend. Of, I mean, I'm in New York; I see it all the time. It's like every weekend they're pro they're we're out they're out protesting, and we're I mean the same thing happened with Iraq too. I mean these, yeah. these like large scale protests they really haven't done anything. I mean Gaza's done. Gaza's demolished. Oh yeah, they've. Um, I mean, you're talking hundreds of thousands of casualties. Over you know, and it's not even it's not it's not coming. That's going to take years to rebuild. And even it, and even whoever is going to do that is probably BlackRock and Vanguard and all these traditional. And you know who's going to come in after that is the all the Israeli settlers who already said they're they're opening up beachfront properties. Donald Trump, his own son-in-law, is opening up a a, a hotel. Yeah. down there wait it's but over. it's already over but people and people on the tv yeah. told me he's anti-establishment i'm confused <laughs> yeah so i mean I well wanna... here's the thing about that i don't <laughs> like the establishment so much i'm just the best in terms of israel <laughs> that's, that's a good impression it's a good impression yeah I, I wanted to i'll probably you. do it a lot more now that you've given me the go-ahead <laughs> <laughs> Are we directing action in the wrong way? Like, why? I mean, why are why do we have why do we have comrades killing themselves as opposed to like, we're 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 almost running into walls. We're 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 sitting here. We're we're out there protesting in, in front of like buildings, getting tear gas and, uh, and trampled by horses on by cops, cops on horses, and it, people are we have fellow comrades that are burning themselves alive. Yeah, and none of none of it has done anything. None of it, ha no, nothing has changed. And in no. fact, it's gotten only worse. I um, 
leftists leftists hate me when I make this reference because apparently it was a right wing only thing. But um, we had a successful organization event up here that achieved its desired result. The truckers. Uh, yes. Yeah. And what they did was they disrupted what? Capital. That's and right. And that's what got it. That's what got that's it worse. done. It doesn't matter. If it was right. I don't think they had. On your mic, your mic's going out for a little while. Oh, sorry. There you go. There you go. Um, yeah. I don't think these people were exclusively right wing. I don't think that that, you know, I don't like, and it doesn't matter, but I don't think to say, well, like every one of these truckers was definitely a right winger. Like, I think that's absurd for one, but for two, I don't really give a shit if they're, le- or am I allowed to curse? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Fuck All right. I don't really, ass. I don't give a shit if they were left or right. The thing that they did was correct. Like, that's what worked. And it's just to think that the idea that whatever ideology they have matters in the least when it turns to their material effect. They disrupted capital and the proof is in the pudding. They got what they wanted. Like, that's what you do. And when I see these people talking about um, free Palestine and they're in the middle of a road sitting... I'm like, you're not disrupting capital. You're disrupting the everyday person. Uh, and then some people will say, well, we're disrupting them from going to work and capital needs them. No, capital doesn't. There's a massive labor surplus. Capital can can fire that person and get a different person who's going to walk. It's like, it's it, these people don't think at all about material consequence or effect or, or even relationship. Like, And the thing is, they'll say that they do. That, that, this, is, this is, to me, the problem of the left. They will say, oh, yeah, I love Karl Marx. I love material analysis. That's the, I mean, class is the problem, man. But then it doesn't matter at all in their action. They clearly don't plan action around that principle. They plan action around uh, what's going to piss off the bad other people. Like, or even, like, not even the bad other people, but just the bystander that doesn't even really have a political consciousness of any kind. It's, to me just complete nonsense and to your question greg um in terms of why i think we're landing on this suicidal ideology is because as i said in the documentary i think there's three places to land there's suicidal ideology um homicidal ideology and you see that uh in various forms um you could bring it to them trying to kill trump or bringing it to uh even the unabomber i would say as an example of where you go without material, when you you don't target the actual contradictions of capitalism, the material relationships, when you don't target that, you end up at suicidal, homicidal, or genocidal, like the Nazis. Um, that's degrowth uh, to the extreme. You know, you get you get the the need to get rid of a bunch of people, and uh, eventually capitalism does get to that point because of the uh, what. Marx called the crisis of overproduction. I, I often call it a value crisis because I think overproduction colloquially means something very different now. It means like, we're just making too much stuff. And, and Marx's overproduction is a totally different thing. It's about uh, the falling rate of profit and producing in order to try to maintain profits uh, when nobody has any money in the other class. Um, but I think that we get there because there's a sort of puritanism in terms of what we have to do, like in the leftists' minds. And this is the sort of, let's call it a revolutionary terminating cliche. Um, We just talked about how these quote-unquote, at least in the leftist eyes, right-wing truckers getting what they attempted to get by disrupting capital, but they were right-wing, so they were bad. So we can't work with them, we can't do anything. All right, well, your class analysis is out the window right there. You're done with it. You don't even care about class because those people and all of the apolitical people that they hate so much, um, those are the people that you need to organize with. Those are the people with the same material interests as you. Um, Maybe not the same job or the same opinion, but like ultimately the relationship between um, owner and not owner, (laughs) you're on the same side of that line with those people and you need to figure out how to at least exist with those people and work with those people. You don't have to like them. I don't need to like any of these. I, like, I as much as I find like Donald Trump, for instance, very, very funny. Um, I enjoy listening to him yeah. talk 
I don't like Donald Trump. I don't think I that he's... Any, yeah, I don't agree yeah. with any of it. Yeah, no, there's not... I mean, sometimes he'll say something that diagnostically is correct, but he will never offer the correct solution. No. <clears throat> no he sent javelin missiles to Ukraine. He wants to go bomb Iran. <laughs> and that's kind of... Possible. That's kind of a cla like material class ignorance from a lot of people, too. I see these people who, who are like, this billionaire... He definitely, like, this billionaire who was born into wealth and his dad forked over hundreds of millions of dollars to keep him from bankrupting a casino and he did it fucking anyway. Uh, like, yeah, he's got our, he's got our best interests at heart. He really, he speaks to what, he speaks to my needs. And it's like, sure. guys. Yeah. Like. I mean. Yeah. If I'm going to be completely frank, I do appreciate the idea of attempting to talk to North Korea, but also like that's one out of how many of his foreign policy, uh, like he's lately been talking about, he like makes attempt, starting. Like he attempted to make peace in the Middle East. It wasn't good, but like yeah, he, at I least appreciate he tried. the idea at very least. But an idea is not ultimately a result. It is uh, again. If you're talking about the difference between classes, his his ultimate interests do not. I mean, maybe his immediate interests don't actually involve war, and he's really only thinking that way. But his ultimate interests, the end game, war is really something that they have to do because eventually you do have to address the crisis of overproduction, and you either have to do it via um, people self selecting out against suicide, uh, like the made program up there that you guys have, which is. Oof. <laughs> real good love it yeah. um i've been yeah i've talked a lot about that on on uh i have a show the maple files which does right. all canada stuff they do and uh yeah it's it's, it's weird. a great we've name got, yeah we've got pe the the moose is out there anyway um <laughs> but to, we, bring up, to bring up like this we, uh, like left conversation like that, I I thought that this is a, this is included in the doc, but like this is a very uh, like I I I haven't seen this until I saw the documentary. But yeah, the thing is, you know, both of these guys are of course evil. Um, Louis C.K. Uh, masturbates in front of people, and Shane Gillis doesn't hate, uh, you know, all of the right people. Uh, he he swooped in and took the sponsorship from Dylan Mulvaney, I guess, from the the Bud Light. I, I guess that we makes also sense too. The we also don't know if he masturbates in front of people or not. That's yeah, he could masturbate in front of people, but like they I, could all I, masturbate in front of each other. Back, though. He made a decent comeback. I mean, yeah. I, I think he did it. I mean, you know, it's not. Like, it's not like he raped someone. I mean, I no, guess. no. If I'm serious, like I don't give a shit about that. I don't all. really. Even, yeah, I don't even really care. Either. I like, always I thought it was funny. I thought gross, it was legendary. Gross, but like you know, there's weird. a pretty fair That's amount weird. of evidence that Very weird. a lot of those people were not necessarily coerced in any way to be part of that and it's sure like there are power dynamics i'm not going to pretend there aren't but i don't know if you've ever listened to sarah silverman talk about the time he did it in front of her she basically was like all right like i feel like a lot of people get into situations like that not just with louis ck or masturbating but even just like a bad date or something they turn it around and the guy's suddenly evil instead of just unbearable you know yeah it sounds more yeah. awkward and weird than like i agree I don't, don't like it. Not I mean, <laughs> the things that that Louis says about the left here, I thought were really like hard hitting. Really, they are. Uh, come on. Sorry, uh, you go ahead. We're, and it's such a mess over on the on the on the Democrat side. And but it can't be these. It can't be these guys who are just pushing whatever button that day. I'm going to go against the liberals on this because that's what they're mad about today. It's got to be somebody who goes back to just regular. And I don't want a conservative president, but I believe I live in a democracy and that the president should only sometimes reflect my values because I'm I'm a part of the country. I'm not the whole country. Yeah. So if I lived in a country where I love the president my whole lifetime, that would be fucked up <laughs> because I only agree with about 38 percent of the people in the country. Yeah. So that's to me the the what is the test of what a president should be? Is it that he should be compassionate, strong, all these? To me, what he should be is a representative of the people's will. He remember this thing that I said. He is a president. He presides. Like when they talk about like real intellectuals talk about it, and real press guys, they say you are president. They don't say you're the president. They say you're president. And Obama used to say when it comes to president, he didn't say being the. He said president. Because it's a verb. 
It's presi- you're presiding. Like I said, it's not, it's a simple job. Trump always talks about leader when you're a leader. You're not a leader. You're not a ruler. You are presiding over a process. You're presiding over a process of equals deciding things together. You're supposed to be just one of the people who was chosen to step up and and run shit for a while, being told by this group of all that's all we also voted for what to do. That's what the legislators and then these nine people who are looking after making sure that it all that it's re- supposed to result in the right thing and keeping after the keeping the tiller in the right direction. Yeah, but it's a pr- it's a humble position. That's why I don't think it belongs to a guy like him. Um, I think it's fascinating that he took it for as long as for those and they win. It makes them stronger. I yeah, mean, yeah. Clinton proved that. It's just so fucking stupid. If, but, it, wasn't, uh, if it wasn't for COVID, we'd, he'd still he'd still be there. I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to say. He really was running hot, and he, didn't, con- give a, and he yeah. didn't give a fuck. And that's just a something's going to get you. Same with Nixon. Same with Caligula. Just somebody, something that you left because you didn't care. Same with that shoots so high. But it burns a moment. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you start to take a dump into the ground. Yeah, the left part is somewhere over here. The thing on the left is they have no. There you go. Yeah, we're getting. About there. Trump is that he had no respect for the for democratic process. To me, the thing on the left is they have no respect for liber- for uh, liberty. That this America is about democracy and liberty. Okay, it's about that we choose amongst ourselves and that there's a working fair democracy. And it's about you can say what you want, you can believe what you want. You can be who you want. You can have the identity you want. You can be anything you want. And no one and you and the the great American um, ideal is leave people the fuck alone. That's the one they forget. It's not about like say this, say that. It's about leave folks alone. Let people do what they want. And the left forgot that. They don't give a fuck about freedom of speech anymore. They don't get how stupid it is to shut people up and how quickly that's going to come around and kick you in the ass. Same thing with Trump. If you just wield authority like this, say, fuck democracy, no one's going to have your back. Yeah. No one's going to be there to, to make sure you're doing the right thing like the press is supposed to do and doesn't do anymore. Um, so that's, to me, the two sides have fucked up the, those, yeah. two, those two principles. And that the problem is both those sides are correct to point the finger at the other side. Yes, that's and why be it's like, a, this is why we're fucked up. That's why we're fucked up. That's and they why just it becomes, won't stop. That's why it becomes a looking yeah. glass because they don't understand each other. And yes, they are right about each other. Yeah, they're right. They're right about each other. The left is right about Trump. And Trump's right about the left and all the people that are left, that are, you know. And so it's a mess. But the thing I count on is just human spirit, human nature, which is that we got to we we, is- we like each other. I think uh, and this and we right like to here. laugh at each other. This right here is exactly where he goes wrong. Like some of the stuff he's talking about, about the president presiding and not being a leader. I also think that's kind of wrong because, I mean, you're ultimately like the the big guy. You kind of are a leader by default. But that's that's not even concerning to me. He's yeah, completely right. Left part, but. He is completely right with this left stuff because it, it's just it completely understands the culture war. It completely understands where it's getting. And then. He does exactly what you do when you don't have material analysis. He goes, you know, I just gotta, I gotta rely on the human spirit, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's exactly- always, it. Always, always goes back to human nature. I, that's, I feel like human nature is like the placeholder. If you're like, if you're working with an integer in programming, it's like the placeholder for material analysis a lot of yeah. the time. Yeah, I you mean, just well, insert human nature, and it's like, okay. Well, the thing is. They don't have material analysis, but they need something material to go to. So it has to be a mystical thing that they transform in their mind into something material. Human nature is uh, malleable. It's all hell. Like the conditions around us shape human nature. Like it's, it's not even close to like a thing that is like in our genetics genetically people are just greedy and you know you got enough people who want something and they they end up starting to you know take it from everybody it's like no 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 that stuff it's all part of trying to live in a world that is set up the way that we are set up it is us trying to come up with how on earth do you survive or even thrive in this world that is built to only allow some of us to survive and thrive it's 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 a question and an answer rather than some kind of 
you know, intrinsic thing. If you had a different situation, people would react differently. I don't see even how that's not common sense personally, but uh, that they need to be able to transform something into material. And so something like human nature or essentialism or bigotries, like when they say anti-Semitism is the socialism for fools, it's referring exactly to this. We're trying, they're trying to find something that can be looked at as material to justify the thing that they're thinking. I like, I, I like, there's a point in the doc you said, um, the documentary, you said um, the left is like emotional abuse and the right is a uh, physical abuse. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty perfect analogy. I, ab- I appreciate that a lot because um, I, I say that from some experience in my life. I've experienced emotional abuse. And you, it's very, very difficult to even convince yourself that you're being abused in some way. And, you know, it comes from that experience. I don't know if you remember when Will Smith slapped Chris Rock at the Oscars because of his wife. He was laughing at Chris Rock's joke, looked over, and she's like, and he gets up and, and turns psychotic. It's because he has to prove that he's not the bad guy. Um, Chris Rock is the bad guy. I'm on your side. That's a, a symptom of somebody who's abused. I said something about it when it happened, and absolutely everybody freaked out over it. And then it turned out to be completely right. Um, shocking, I know. But there's a certain degree of being unable. There's a paralysis that comes along with emotional abuse isn't present with physical abuse. A lot of people, and I'm not saying this isn't, uh, I'm not trying to universalize anybody's experience with any abuse, but I generally find when I've spoken to somebody who's experiencing emotional abuse, they have a big problem accepting it themselves, and they also have a big problem um, saying this needs to change, or it's it's usually apologetics. Uh, and, And I'm not saying that doesn't happen with physical abuse. It does. But if somebody goes into work with a black eye and it's obvious that they're being beaten by their spouse or something, that is, I mean, externally, people are like, that person's being beaten by their spouse. You know, they figure that out very quickly and very easily. Whereas if somebody comes in and starts talking about a bunch of like, I I guess, esoteric almost points about their own personal lives that don't make any sense without any context. Like, nobody believes there's abuse going on. Um, And that's why they often don't even bother justifying it to themselves or telling other people because they feel like, ah, this is going to sound completely nuts if, if I am complaining about this. And I feel like that's what the left is like because ostensibly a lot of my goals and end games are very similar to what a leftist would say. Um, but I I mean, the thing that they want, the thing that they'll do, the thing like if you remember after January 6th, like uh, this is going to get me in trouble because anytime I mention January 6th, I get people angry at me, but this is true. I would have the same criticism as a lot of people would if they just call it a riot as opposed to, um, a, uh, what is it? An insurrection. Uh, yeah. Insurrection. Yes. Insurrection is no, the word I was Nan- Shooting on Nancy Pelosi's desk is not an insurrection. No, that's not an, it's not an insurrection. That's it's true. a riot. And I do, have riot. Criti- I do have criticism for people who are rioting and destroying stuff. That doesn't actually. That's another example of not targeting capital. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, like, exactly. Like across the board, I condemn defecating in someone's place of work. They have to, you know, that's not nice. Pelosi. I mean, yeah. on the flip side, destroying a target because somebody was killed. Um, did that change anything about that death or the police system? Absolutely not. It's not targeting capital, and it's kind of targeting unrelated capital, in fact. It's just something, like, literally targeting. I didn't, I didn't just realized I'm using the word target to talk about target. Um, sorry, ADHD. It happens. Um, it does. All the time here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I... I I feel like the the thing that you're what I talk about when I get to that is all of the anarchists who are so happy to turn in like anybody, including they're like, if my family member was there, I would turn them in. And there were liberals who were turning in um, people who had been there, who were in their families, who were just to the FBI, like happily handing over this information when they're aware that the FBI is against what they ostensibly want. 
they're aware that the FBI would just absolutely like, let's say they were doing uh, some kind of leftist protest and uh, similar things happened. They would be arrested. They would be behind bars. They would be used as propaganda as look at how bad the left is. Look at how bad these guys are. And the thing is, when you get into talking about the you way when Marjorie Taylor Greene said, like, abolish the FBI. Yes. They want to like, abolish uh, like and they, and they all jumped on her for that. Yes, they were they were very happy to say, no, the FBI is good. The FBI, I mean, they did some bad things back in the 60s and 70s, but, I mean, that was back then, and they've just... CIA is good now. They don't do anything there's, bad. There's no way they're still doing that, because they told us they were doing that, and that means they're, they're obviously not stopping, which, hey, there's that emotional abuse coming back. Like, doesn't that mm-hmm. sound exactly like emotional abuse? The CIA, they told us they were doing bad things. They... Uh, they um, opened up all of the, the paperwork about it. They showed us the evidence. And they said, you know what? We're not doing anything like that anymore because we know that's bad, right? Uh, I'm, I wouldn't do that to you again, boo, you know? <laughs> oh, oh, don't worry. He's changed. Same exactly. Energy. Yes, he's changed energy is exactly what we're talking about with the CIA. Yeah. And all of the shit they did, like Cointel <laughs> Pro, all, it's all he's changed energy. <laughs> And a lot of the left is already based on like a lot of like moral grandstanding and like yeah. signaling. It's 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 all like a morality based kind of like or like are you a good person kind of thing? Yeah. Or like as the right is like uh it's it's more property focused, like individual like at a, but even nowadays, like with the rise of Trump, like you, you kinda you kinda briefly mentioned this too, where like you're you're seeing the right kind of bring up or at least like put more value onto like more like hum- humanistic like principles or like at least like more class-based like i would say anti being anti-war is like class-based i wouldn't i don't know if you would say that the right is like quote-unquote anti-war but like they are based on like more like class-based issues like freedom of health and freedom of uh personal liberty mm-hmm. uh voting like that our, our voting system is actually fucked and we we that, that's a concern that's primarily on the right yeah no so like, i mean if you even talk about the voting system as bad you are a right winger like that's enough to make you a fascist like you say the democracy is not working as it should somehow that means you're you're a trump voter or uh, i think in your i don't remember who's the conservative guy up there i don't remember his name he's kind of Kind of not Trumpish in rhetoric, but like that BB. sort of. Yeah, PP. Oh, PP. Yeah. I call him Millhouse because, yeah, he just. I, until think, he, oh. I don't remember if I had him in the documentary because he said something. No, I didn't put him in this documentary. It was in Marks for Sale, I put him in because he was saying something that sounds like a leftist would care about. Uh, and I was kind of using that as an example. I think in Marks for Sale, which was a documentary from last year. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the right being anti-war, in some ways it sort of makes them a little bit like the 60s left, uh, as Jordan Peterson might say. Um, the second part of the documentary, I, I covered that interview between Jordan Peterson and Destiny. And they, I think, I mean, they also, just like Louis, um, although I, I'll say Louis, in my opinion, is closer to getting it than they mm-hmm. are. But they are also the thing I appreciated from both Peterson and Destiny in that interview is that there is an actual intellectual curiosity, which is something you never see between a right wing influencer and a left wing influencer. And somebody will be like, nah, Destiny's not left wing influencer. He's also a right wing influencer. No. And this is the no true, no true Scotsman fallacy that we deal with, with not just leftists, but people calling themselves communists as well. Everything's not real cap. Uh, not real communism and with the right i guess we we do also get the the, it's not real com or capitalism sorry we don't have true capitalism now it's it's a mix of real yeah yeah it's a mix Uh, of capitalism no they'll call this they'll call this communism what's happening right now they'll call this communism yes pp pp is currently like literally i covered this one of the the eighth richest person in canada has a sign in front of his house now calling our left party the ndp uh communists they're like mm. center, they're center going left, off on baby. comrade kamala that's a talking yeah, about it's yeah. just kamala she's gonna go ahead and destroy <laughs> democracy we're gonna be 
in a total uh, socialist, communist, a uh, fascist, uh, totalitarian all of them. It's all going to happen, and it's all from that side. That's one hell of a multi-class. I just like to say socialist, fascist, communist. And I love how he just rattles them off. These aren't like even things in his head. No, he just like he doesn't know just what wor- things are. Just birdshot words. Just I, I, I think he legitimately thinks so like these idiots aren't going to like nobody's going to push. Back oh, yeah. He doesn't care. Like he's not saying anything that he cares about. He's just like, I know that these people, they don't know what any of this stuff is. So it doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, pretty much. But um, um The other thing I was going to say was it's not just that they use uh, communism and or a a competent, sorry, a compilation of capitalism and communism. There's a lot of them that also um, they do the this is uh, corporate capitalism or corporatism. Cronyism. Yeah. Crony capitalism is a big one. That's I've heard actually probably heard that more than corporatism. But yeah, I mean, they just make up a new word. To- I always argue, like, like up here for no, me. that's capitalism. Like, like right here, if you put an adjective, I'm back. It said, it said, I lost. I always argue, like, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see you now. Yeah. Just- okay. Okay. So they they just put an uh, like a word in front of capitalism, and they think that that makes it different. And I say in this documentary, I say, look, I don't say that there this wasn't real communism. I, I, I don't. I, I have no like I agree that things went wrong in the Soviet Union. Like it mm-hmm. doesn't exist anymore. So something clearly didn't work. Um, I don't agree with the Cultural Revolution in China. I think uh, the current Chinese government also doesn't agree with it. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't think that there's anything wrong with admitting that every giant social system has serious problems, um, especially in an implementation that is imperfect and not really the end game. Like, we're not talking about China being the end game or the USSR being the end game. We're talking about, you know, what is the contradiction? How are we trying to solve it? Those two countries tried to solve it. Like, that's the difference between me and somebody who's going to say the no true Scotsman's fallacy about communism but also uh, i expect that somebody who would allow me to say those things and still support communism um to say all right well i guess crony capitalism i guess corporate capitalism i guess corporatism or any of these numbers of things they're also capitalism and you know what they have actually more atrocities than communism by a lot uh like more like because every large atrocity of like the overarching social uh, and economic system is of capitalism. <laughs> like, well, the thing the the thing that I argue with is um, they always do the like eight guerrillian deaths under Stalin, Mao, Zilla, or whatever they're doing. I'm I'm shocked how many people do not. The, Holodomor always got to throw the Holodomor oh, yeah, out there. Oh yeah, um, That's not just I a banner shocked. or anything. Yeah, I'm shocked how many people I have to educate where I'm like, you realize there was a drought that actually killed a shitload of Russians, right? And they're like, no. And I'm like, yes. What, what also, do you think of famine? I, I get the kulaks. I get that argument. Uh, right. Collectivization was hard, sure. But to just ignore a massive drought that caused catastrophic crop failure, like, we're not we're not looking this at this in the same lens at all. It's not like... Stalin was twirling his mustache and being like, I'm going to cause I'm going to I'm going to do a drought today. Like, yeah, like we're not (laughs) like the way I the way I look at it is as such in psychology. Sorry, I'm going to psych nerd out for a second. In psychology, there is (laughs) a specific term for black and white thinking. It's called splitting. And it's when you are unable to see any middle ground. Um between between two points everything has to be either a one or a zero and everybody i feel when it comes to stuff like communism they fall into this trap where they're going this had problems therefore it's bad we can't use it whereas i think the correct way of looking at these uh these systems is to go okay what did the ussr get right well it lifted Mm -hmm. millions of people out of poverty and not for nothing for all the people that said it 
failed, but it went from a largely agrarian country to an e economic superpower that windmill dunked on a fascist dictator in, in decades. That's that's a W. That's not an L. Let's of not forget the problems. space program. Yeah, the space, the space program. program. I mean, they beat the United States of America into space like they just flat out handed us our asses. And depending on who you talk to, I, I don't believe this. I believe in the moon landing. But there's a lot of people that don't meet, believe in the moon landing on the right, I might add, that don't think about the fact that the Soviets were much more advanced in that entire thing that we had to throw. I, if you don't believe in it, we didn't throw trillions of, or mil, billions of dollars at it. But if you do believe in it, we, we threw tons nothing. and tons of money at beating them. And it became like our biggest priority as a country to beat the Soviets in the space race, which is JFK ran on that. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's because it's, ridiculous. It, it's because it wasn't just it wasn't just a space race for them. It was like our ideology is backing this. Our ideology, American values, has to be the communist ideology because we can't let these dirty proles look at any alternative to the shit we got going on right now because our paymasters can't have that. You can't provide an alternative to this system of systemic exploitation Absolutely. but i was gonna say you know they you know they beat america so bad they had to fake the moon lighting <laughs> <Just, laughs> only like quote-unquote like socialist like communists these days or like think they, their idea of like a communist society is like no one works and like yeah. no one has a job which is like totally the opposite of the case i mean and Look, like, like communism, like uh, no social system is supposed to be. It's not going to be perfect because uh, nothing is perfect. And like China is not perfect. There's no. definitely problems with China. And China, even they that even what they call it is communism with Chinese characteristics. Yes, it's not tradition. It's not like what people would call traditional communism. But they, you know, seventy percent of millennials own houses. They lifted millions of people out of poverty. They have huge production value. They have the, one of the largest economies in the world. So I mean, they'll bring up the children. They will be the biggest economy eventually. There's, I mean, they're on the way up. Like their goal is up, and they care about um, lifting people. I mean, even if it's, let's say it's for bad reasons, they care about getting people into houses. They care about not having people in poverty. Let's say. It's for some evil reason that it's just to beat the West. Let's say it's their space yeah. race. They're building okay, fine. Africa. They're building. Oh yeah, exactly. It just it just turn translates into people's material conditions improving, and to put heaps of narrative on top of that, it's like the all the articles where it's like China did this base thing, but at what cost? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> like road, like oh what, at what cost? They building. They think building stuff for other countries is imperialism. Yeah, I yeah, it's because like, I, I don't know if you guys have played uh, any Sid Meier games before, but um, I have, but it has been since the 90s that yeah, I've played any of these um, city builders. Well, no, I take that back. I've played them recently. So for those who aren't familiar, it's like a, Sid Meier's games are like civilization. You you try and win essentially by different, you can achieve victory in different uh, areas so you can win by total domination which is you just take over the whole world guess we know what uh what players in the world today are doing that uh but um and then you can win like diplomatic economic victory china is just trying to win via a different route than america's trying to win than the western empire is trying to win western empire is trying to win like through domination china's trying to win through like like economic and cooperation and, yeah diplomatic victory because yeah. if everybody's an ally everybody's working together there, there's no competition anymore everybody's just working together we can go explore uh alpha centauri and whatever i have a also conservative friend that I, i'm constantly talking to about china because that seems to be his sort of pet like you like china and china's bad you know so yeah. i always bring up uh he always one of the arguments he loves to bring up is you brought it up, is them uh, building in Africa. In, in his opinion, that is just like, you can't say it's bad that we're building in Africa with China, your precious communist building in Africa. It's like, well, here's the thing. We don't build there just to build there. We build there to own there. Like, that's mm -hmm. what we're trying to do there. We want property. 
we want control. We Oil. want well, and when I say we, obviously, I mean our our state and capital. I don't mean the three present people, uh, but that's what we want out of that. China does not want that. They want independence so that they have somebody else to work with. Uh, they mm -hmm. don't own property that they build. Like the intent is not to um, build something that they have a long term material interest in outside of their cooperative relationship with these places. And that's a completely different paradigm. And it's just so hard for somebody who thinks about things as uh, business in certain ways to see that. Um, like his rebuttal to me is always, well, business has to expand. So they're just doing business. And it's like, yes, but also their version of business is not our version of business. It's a different thing. Like their, their goal is for more uh, entities, whether it be their citizens uh, or other countries that they intend to be able to have a symbiotic relationship with. They want those other entities to succeed as well. And that is very different than our conception of business. <clears throat> no, for sure. Um, <clears throat> so, funny you mentioned that. I have a I have a conservative friend too who's like, I I try and connect the dots for him where I'm like, dude, they're not even doing new propaganda. They took the McCarthy era propaganda. They just replaced a name and then they just fed it back to you. And that's they that's made it what shittier too, honestly. Like it's not, yeah. it's not as good. Like it used to be more convincing. Yeah. Now it's just like, now they're, they're, they're literally just like, Oh, but what about like social credit score? And I'm like, you have a social credit score right now, motherfucker. It's, called your it's credit just not, score. <laughs> yeah, credit it's your score. credit score. <laughs> and worse, it's based just on how poor you are. You lose rights for no other reason. Well, that's the and thing just, they don't make the connection. Like your social status is your economic status. They that yeah. just never it doesn't click. And that I'm yeah. not even talking about right wing people there. I'm talking about everybody there. Every United States uh, citizen, not every, but like all of these leftists, they think the same thing. It's not like like when I've I've had leftists come at me with the social credit argument, like. We can't do China because they have social credit. It's like, all right, well, cool. You watch Vosh for one, <laughs> for two, <laughs> first L, <laughs> for two. It's a red I don't give a shit. I just don't give a shit. Like the social credit thing. Like a, I'm not being told the full truth on that by anybody who is reporting on it here in the United States. No. B, I don't give a shit because we have a worse thing here. It's called a credit score. It is about how if you are poor, you should have no access to anything that could help you not be poor. That's yep. I mean, it's literally a thing that locks you out of economic progress. Low balance. Yeah, fees. it's then, literally it, like, oh, oh, is your purchasing power not sufficient to survive? Well, we're going to make life even worse for you. Well, and if please, you're if your you purchasing power, power isn't high like enough, money. you can't live in this neighborhood. Uh, what is that? Is that a non-social credit score? Does that have nothing to do with your social uh, position in society? Does that have nothing to do with who you're around and who you can collaborate with? Because uh, let's say your credit score is dog shit. You're going to live in a poor area. You're going to have a higher likelihood of being plugged into some sort of drug trade or some sort of illicit activity that makes you some kind of money. And oh, wh what is that? How is, is that just like something that's not a social credit score? Like, how do people not make that connection? And the thing is, is I, I run the risk of saying those people are dumb. And it's not that they're dumb. They are not dumb. No person here is dumb and, until they until they get aggressive with me. And then I'm happy to call them dumb or any other number of words that uh, <laughs> YouTube doesn't like. <laughs> but before <laughs> before I get to that point, I don't assume anybody's dumb. Like the thing is, a lot of these people are operating on a lack of information. And that's not being dumb. Um, that's. Uh, that's an understanding that's built on faulty information. And that's not their fault, in my opinion. Um, does that mean, like, <laughs> does that mean, like, you're not stuck? You know, like, in, in, you know, to, to use the line, um, I'm not stuck in here with you, you're stuck in here with me. I feel like we're kind of with that person a lot of the time. Like, you're stuck in here with me. Like, all of these people think you're stuck in here with me. You got to deal with my problems. Um, and, 
I guess, yes, I would like to deal with your problems, but you have to actually listen to anything that I have to say. And you have to understand that when I make a comparison to this side and that side, and I'm saying that both sides are bad in some way. In, the, in this case, like, do I like what social credit sounds like? No, I don't. I don't like it. But we have that already, and it's worse. So uh, both sides are bad. <laughs> like those same kind of like justifications. Like, I mean, we're there's a whole abandoned Harris movement. I mean, it. J- I mean, Jill is actually like twenty points up in like Michigan. But um, really, something. Yeah, uh, that's my home state. I. Uh, I mean, I don't talk with anybody from Michigan that would be have a propensity to uh, support Jill Stein. Like, I was a Bernie supporter when I lived last. I lived in Michigan, and even Bernie supporters were like, "Nah, I don't know Jill Stein," you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's not even necessarily the support of like Jill Stein. It's mostly just like not rewarding your vote to an actual genocider. Like, there's a whole, uh, you know, art. You know, we're less than twenty eight days away from the election there's a whole argument right now based on like yeah you know, at least on like the pro-palestine like side of you know twitter or social media is like do, do you vote for harris is that damage control or is that like and there's always this primary focus on like oh but we need trump is going to be worse on domestic issues trump is going to be worse for gay people or trans people and we're our rights matter and it's it, above all the babies that are being slaughtered over there. And yeah. Here's what I don't. Here's what I don't get. Here's what I really don't get about this whole like X would be worse thing. Both of these sides run the same racket every four to eight years. One of them, they both played against one another. To to Trump supporters, right now, Harris taking over means an end to the country. Yep. Regardless of her being the current VP with yogurt brain at the helm, and the country hasn't ended, it's gotten worse. But if you look at the last fucking couple of decades, it's just been one of these a very st- steady, gradual decline. And then you got you got the Trump. I'm sorry, I'm laughing got- about yogurt brain, and I have to say something. <laughs> that was um, that's yogurt brain is a great. That is a good one. I haven't heard that one personally. <laughs> yogurt brain and soup head are my go tos. Um, <laughs> Just like tilt your head, let the let the Campbells flow out. Um, but like, the thing is, it's both not Campbells. My soup comes from the Gordon Ramsay restaurants. It's the best soup out there. Sorry, but no, not Campbells. Thank you. It's chunky. <laughs> I don't do a good uh, uh, Trump, but yeah, both sides that think that if the other side wins, it's the end of democracy and all that. And you got both sides doing the same thing with the flowery promises. They're like, oh, well, you know, Trump's the lesser evil. No, Harris is the lesser evil. But Trump's going to do all this. Oh, but Harris is going to do all that. And then they get in office. They break all their promises. Both sides do this constantly. Nothing fundamentally changes. That's the illusion that people are, I feel at least, are really uh, the illusion that people buy into. It's like, it's not that like there's ever like a horrible thing that happens. The problem is that just status quo is maintained. Like, business as usual keeps going on, and not enough people realize, like, that's the problem. The problem is business as usual. Because your material conditions right now is business as usual, and you should be pissed off about that. Not, like, this constant... I had a theory a while ago that the whole, like, World Economic Forum Great Reset thing was, like, a psyop to convert revolutionary fervor into, like, reactionary energy. Because you're taking, like, status quo, and you're presenting something, like, way scarier, like, you're going to eat the bugs and live in a pod, and they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna use you for, like, uh, like fuel. I think I just actually copied Brave New World. Anyway, um, but, like, they're, pre- they're presenting something way scarier, so they get people to cling to the status quo. But the real thing, you should be upset about how business as usual is going. Not like how dark and scary the future can be, because it's like it's dark and scary right now. Well, and the thing is, business as usual is a cycle of decay. That's the other thing. Like, while they may tell us that the numbers go up, the problem is that the numbers are something that they report to us, A. And B, uh, the numbers are also dependent on other numbers that people don't understand. 
uh, like inflation, for instance. Inflation is not something that a normal person understands. They understand price go up, but they don't understand inflation. Now, price go up uh, is a result of the falling rate of profit. Uh, they have to increase prices uh, in order to maintain profit. Uh, but at the same time, um, when you have less people who are able to afford something, you have to produce more of it to produce profit. What you end up doing is exactly what's happening is this general decay of quality of life. Um, the thing is, that is the status quo. It's always going to be the status quo in monopoly imperial capitalism. It's never going to change. You have people who are saying, like, it's neo-feudalism or we're in some new thing. And it's like, no, uh, we have new things happening in the world, sure. But this all comes back to the core contradiction of the socialization of production with the private appropriation of product and profit. It creates a mathematical impossibility to maintain the stat to, to maintain the status quo. Now, when I say to maintain the status quo there, I'm saying something different than what we're saying uh, sort of colloquially here. Uh, to maintain the, uh, the an equilibrium where even we maintain the same numbers or profits, uh, that's not physically possible with the way that uh, socialized production's appropriation of product and profit is. It's literally impossible because uh, you have one class that takes a fraction of the value of something and the other class that takes uh, from that from that class the, the, what is left, the surplus, the profit. Uh, that will always make an upward transfer of wealth, which will always make it impossible for the underclass to continually purchase the things that would create equilibrium. Now, this doesn't happen straightforwardly. It happens in different uh, sectors, different industries. It goes on. Uh, sort of non-linearly, but it's also the thing that continually happens. It's always going to be that. And that's the status quo. And that's why our lives are becoming less and less good as they say numbers go up. Sure, numbers can go up, but like who's getting the profit? Is it me? No, it's not. I'm not getting the profit. You are getting the profit, capitalists. And as you do that, you are actually shooting yourselves in the foot because you depend on us in order to buy the things. And eventually you're going to create a situation where we can't buy the things. That's the problem of capitalism. It's not that it's unfair or mean or greedy or any of that shit. It's that it's a mathematical impossibility to create equilibrium. That's the problem. And that's the status quo. And that's the ongoing thing that they work to protect. And it's the thing that requires human nature in order to prop up. It's the thing that requires these ideologies, this leftism, in, in which uh, divides people from rightism. Uh, if these people are arguing about who is good and who is bad, uh, and it's not pointing over cr class lines, it's pointing over ideological lines. And as we point over ideological lines, we're never getting close to the real problem, which is that mathematical contradiction, which will always doom us to make things decay. It may be slow. It may be like it's happened over the 40 years I've been alive as opposed to instantaneously. But things are infinitely worse now than when I was born. Uh, a company could mm -hmm. start something and make a profit pretty easily. Now you have such a saturation of the market. You have so many people making so many cheap products, and yet they can't make any money off of them because they can't sell them. There's no demand for them. They can't market the demand into existence because nobody has the money to buy shit that they don't absolutely need. And, and that's the real crisis of capitalism. That's the reason we have to solve that contradiction. And I don't care whether you call it neo-feudalism or, or whatever a lot of these people talk about. It's a problem of math. And that math is dependent on solving a contradiction. And as long as we're talking about which of our neighbors are the bad guys, uh, we are not going to solve that contradiction because that contradiction is entirely systemic. It's class. It's, it's math. It's, it sucks because this is what we need to organize people along the lines of. This is, uh, you talked about Rage Against the War Machine. Um, the organization I'm a part of, the Center for Political Innovation, uh, is, has been a sponsor of both of the uh, Rage Against the War Machine events. And we are an openly communist organization. Uh, a lot of the people involved there are, are not communists. They're, in fact, most people involved in Rage Against the War Machine are not communists. They were libertarians. Um, there's a lot of apolitical people. And they they get up and they talk about imperialism. Like they may not have the same analysis, materially speaking, of imperialism as us, but they understand like this isn't about uh, who is good and who is bad. It's about the fact that there is a world system that is ultimately working to undermine not only the people 
outside of our country, but the people inside of our country. Like, we're the problem to them, and that's the problem. How very dialectical of you. Thank you. I was also going to make a joke of, like, if only someone wrote about this contradiction, but that was yeah. crazy. That was a good one. It's not, um, it's not like we have a whole century or more of material that points directly at that. Yeah, I mean, I, the thing is, like, the funny thing I see is that, like, it's, to your point when you're like, these people aren't stupid, this information isn't provided to them throughout any of their education. They, have, they know nothing about this. Like, they don't understand. It's not the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, like, they, yeah. Don't, they don't understand, like, these, they're never going to, here's the thing, I didn't, there was no path for me to becoming a Marxist. I had to go and, like, get a machete and hack through the, the foliage, foliage or foliage? Foliage? I foliage? I think it's foliage. Or foliage. no, foliage, I think. Foliage. But I also pronounce things constantly, so... Yeah. Don't take yeah. my word on it. Yeah, my brain's spicy. But, like, I had to I had to go find that shit yeah. just because of people talking to me and correcting. You know, when I was 20 years old, I had a lot of stupid reactionary kids. They were dumb. Sure. I, was a, I, was a, I was a shit liberal. Yeah, um, I voted for I Obama. I was until, like, at least 2020, I think. I voted for listen, Obama. Listen, Trudeau got me the first time. I've admitted it before. He got me the first time with electoral reform because I was like, you know what? Yeah, first past the post is kind of bullshit. I don't think it's democratic. Let's go. And I was still hurting from the death of my hero at the time, a beautiful mustached man by the name of Jack Layton, who I will credit with radicalizing me. Um, but I like I I had to I'd have people like counter my arguments and like I basically happened upon this stuff. This this information isn't provided to the public, and I don't think that's by accident. But it's like, no, it's it's not that people are stupid. They're working with what they have. It's just the problem is what they have isn't the full picture. If that makes sense. The way the way I got radicalized was in 2011. I was uh, targeted by the media actually for making up a fake girlfriend, but. The time, this time that I have spent sorting through that, I was being catfished at the time, and I was also criticizing various online personalities marketing. Um, and those same personalities, for some reason, found some way to undermine my criticism, which was, hey, there's evidence that the person, this person, is in a long-distance relationship isn't real. So that means if I paint it like he made that up, <laughs> if, yeah. if, if this person made that up, that makes them a bad guy. And so it started with a couple of gossip bloggers who I was feuding with. And then it spread to other like much bigger YouTubers like Ray William Johnson, who also did not appreciate my criticism, which was that they were basically taking money out of out of other YouTubers pockets uh, in a time where I didn't really understand property or I would probably disagree with myself on that at this point. Like I don't really like the content landlording. I'm not a big fan of nowadays, but um mm. He didn't like that. Ultimately, I will say I was on the side of smaller people because the, the grievance I had was the fact that he was using clips from skits and stuff that people were producing and not those people weren't making money. Uh, that's a definite instance of of what a lot of these people and sorry, I'm ADHD here as well. A lot of the people who argued with me on intellectual property is a very similar concern. And again, a lot of those people are coming from a real concern, but then they get to this sort of temporarily embarrassed millionaire thing. Anyway, that's another topic. Um, so anyway, I was like in eventually it, when once these higher profile YouTubers were um, spreading this information around, eventually it got into Gawker, which at the time was a hundred million dollar company and a pretty large media outlet, uh, a large gossip rag, um, really an awful, awful company in my opinion. But they used me and. Uh, like they had no interest in, in like who I was countering or any of that, but I was perfect content for them because this was something that already had like a lot of people in a lot of various YouTubers fandoms that already were mad about this thing. So they were able to tap into that and make a large amount of traffic and that spread. They got very, very big. And ultimately I didn't understand why the hell that happened because to me, Coming from the other direction, if I were looking out at somebody else who, quote unquote, made up a girlfriend, even if it was completely true, I would be so uninterested 
in it. I, I wouldn't give a shit. I'd be like, all right, fine. What else is going on in the world? Yeah. So <clears throat> my kind of path to Marx was finding the interests, why this shit happened. Like, because I, I don't think that any of those people uh, legitimately, and I'm saying this about the people who spread it around, I don't think they thought I, I made up a girlfriend. I think they thought it was a very convenient way of shutting me the hell up and making me uncredible. And to be frank, this is the core of the reason so many people hate me. Uh, well, not recently. I'd say more recently. It's because I told people the same thing that South Park clip that you played at the beginning <laughs> was telling people. <laughs> but yeah, That's why they hate us, too. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. this was the start of people hating me. Like, I would say something and they'd be like, you made up a fake girlfriend, though, so shut the fuck up. And, um, I mean, that stuff, it was insane for me because I, I spent literally a decade figuring out what the fuck happened there. And that led me to Marx because it ultimately ended in what was the interest behind pushing this story for each entity involved? Well, for Gawker, at the very top level, there was already an extreme audience for this cancellation. It was already people who were excited to look at content about it. So they had an audience to tap into. Then we go a, a, a thing lower. These uh, large YouTube and these large, large YouTubers, they had this smaller YouTuber who was gaining popularity I was on Annoying Orange. I was on a, very, a lot of other uh, channels that were getting me notoriety, and I was getting millions of views on song parodies. Um, here's this small person that is slowly getting bigger that might be able to uh, you know, sway some people away from my camp. Um, I don't like that idea. I don't want somebody discrediting me. I don't want somebody criticizing me. So there's the reason. That's the incentive for them to either believe it or cynically not believe it and spread it around. Um, and then we go a, a thing lower. I was criticizing this gossip blogger for selling plastic surgery to kids. Like they were actively sponsored by um, plastic surgeons in their country. And their audience was primarily teenagers. Uh, so I criticized that. And the same thing. Like shut this person the fuck up. So there's a material interest behind why people would make this up and spread it or even just misinterpret intentionally things that were going on because I was being catfished. So I had on two fronts uh, was just getting blown out the ass, you know, <laughs> my um, social life and my um, professional life, both just right in my face. Yeah, I think the biggest shit storm I ever caused was on it was around the time the MAGA communism shit first went down. This tw this one tweet caused the biggest shit storm I think I've ever had on any social media platform ever. But I just, um, it was something really simple. Like, to all the people who are losing their minds over MAGA communism, and it was just like the gym from the office thing with the writing on the board, that meme. It was just like, if you're not ready to organize with people you disagree with, you're not ready to fight a class war. It was the whole thing. Mm -hmm. The fucking meltdown from the left over that, oh my god. I was just like, wait, what What do you mean? You guys shouldn't organize along class lines. Wasn't that the thing? Why are you guys yelling at me over this? Well, I was called a MAGA communist from day one, like, before calling me that. And I'm not a MAGA communist. I, I, I actually took I, I, when, when, when that first started rolling around, like, I was sort of like listening to you, like with that your like original criticisms of it, because you were like one of the only people who were actually like calling, you know, calling it like contradictory. Like, cause yeah, it, it really doesn't make any sense. No, it's it's really? not. It's just attempt to like get the tiniest sliver of the Trump fandom and the com the online communists uh, who were just like either socially conservative enough or open to alternative economic ideas enough, um, like just grabbing this tiny little fandom but that's not even the problem i have with maga communism like the stated idea of it is the idea that you would want to reach out to people who are not in agreement with you i completely, i completely agree with that and i think that that's super important yeah. but it's also in the way that the left is the abuse the um, <clears throat> emotionally abusive person it's the same thing except for further like you go Further, you take the idea further. You're just going more. It's quantitative. Like you go further. What is a thing that we can claim that we care about and that is important to us, but also kind of obsess over just that 
for a while. And then eventually it got into, I mean, a lot of pretty fucked up shit, honestly. There's a lot of bigotry that is in, embraced pretty openly over there. Um, oh, yeah. I, don't like getting, <laughs> I don't like getting particularly criti- critical of it because then they start trying to act like I'm just like this big LGBTQ warrior, whereas That's what I we don't... Do. We, cover, we covered it like several times already, like twice, but we, we talk about it like a lot because it's just a phenomenon that like... I actually know people in real life who like are, you know, quote-unquote like MAGA communists, and like it, it, it... On its face, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, Pasta also like... Uh, Craig Pasta also like has like a similar criticism where like it's... I, you're, you're never going to get a Trumper to like agree with anything that's called communism. That's exactly. I, I also, Greg, to your point, I also know people in real life who suffer from schizophrenia, and it's really it's, it's crazy. Bad. It's not crazy, yeah. No. yeah. Um, the thing is, like, the, I feel like it's a bit of a trap. This is just my read on it, because it it's like... The, Fed. He's, he's, he's the way the left is a trap, it's the same. Yeah, but the thing is, like, if you look, if you look at what they focus on, it's all culture shit. Yeah. It's absolutely. all culture shit. It's just in the other direction. It's LG, LGBTQ just as the left. Is like the big gripe. That's the thing. Yeah. They hate yeah. LGBTQ. But the thing is they don't they aren't willing to distinguish between LGBTQ as a ideology propagated by the capitalist class versus sexual and gender minorities who are a legitimate group of people with legitimate grievances. And like a legitimate want to just exist in society rather than anything else. Like most people, I, the people that we see that are quote unquote poisoned, that are LGBTQ, that are high up on the social ladder, on social networks or on TV, the representation, and this is another criticism of mine, it's the parameters of what they want um, non-LGBTQ people or non-sexual and gender minority people to be or to see, sorry, and what they want that group of people to be. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's model minority shit, and it's meant to piss off a certain demographic, and it's meant to please a certain demographic. And if you aren't part of one of those demographics and you aren't viewing it that way, you're a heretic in some way, and you will be attacked by whoever you're affiliated with. And that's, that's really my problem with that. They obsess over LGBTQ as though... It is just the representation of LGBTQ. It's just the representation of sexual and gender minorities. I make a big distinction between queer theory and LGBTQ as an ideology and sexual and gender minorities as a legitimate group of people with legitimate grievances in society and who have the right to live. Like, you know, I, I don't get too much into my own identity, but like I'm a little, I'm a little what you would call queer, but I don't, I don't use that word. I don't, I don't talk about those types of things personally because it gets me associated with queer theory and lgbtq and there's really like there's so much there that is alienating to me personally um that i don't want to be associated with it i don't want to be arguing for it uh i, I don't like that stuff i i, I it bothers me i but, really just remove myself from the argument altogether yeah i have done the exact same thing and this is as far as i've gone in public in quite a while if i'm completely honest with you and i also i do have to say this i have to get going soon yeah okay. it's all good yeah, yeah, um we can wrap it up. Well, but like, yeah, what would, um, what would you what the thing is the one like lesson that like to kind of like take away from uh, well my the stuff. thing I'm going to beat the I'm going to reduce it down to class guys. <laughs> okay. You know, oh, like no. a Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a total reduction of everything down to class because that's not that's not really taking the concerns of anybody into account. I, and that's what I do. I just, I hate everybody. And I, I just want to talk about class. It's not like every, all of, every one of these issues springs forward from class or anything, uh, an ind- a difference in terms of power, in terms of, you know, th- the thing is all of this is a distraction from the fact that it all comes from a differential or a differential in the power dynamic. That's where it all comes from. If you want to pretend that like somehow that's different for a different group, you're wrong. Power comes from somewhere, and the reason a certain group has it is specific to where that comes from. It's, it's that simple. And every other little branch in terms of power is downstream of that. It's not upstream, and a lot of people want a lot of other people to believe that it is upstream. A lot of people want people to believe that it's about Jews or, or like they just want us all to be queers. It's not that it's absolutely not that it's, it's, it's not even close to that. It's, it's 
those things come from the fact that there is that contradiction I mentioned earlier that makes capitalism mathematically unsustainable at an equilibrium. Like, I mean, you can you can sustain it by force, but that requires degrowth, whether it be war or the green degrowth that we've been dealing with. Uh, the real thing we should care about is that power differential, is that relationship, is that contradiction. And all of this, including the right and the left. And when I say the left, I mean the liberals. I mean the leftists. I mean a lot of people calling themselves communists. They are not talking about or even it's not even that they're not talking about because some of them are talking about this power differential, but they don't really care because none of the shit they do involves it. That it has to. We have to organize along those lines. And that means shit to do with left or right. Like as far as I'm concerned, we have to completely dissociate from that as a primary concern. Like if you want to talk about like how Trump is a douchebag sometimes, fine. Like because he is. But you also have to recognize that Kamala is a douchebag also. Like they're both imperialists. They're both not going to fundamentally change anything. And they're both going to lie a lot about what they're going to do. Um, mm -hmm. They stick each other's policies. Yes. They're, they're, I mean, they literally, which, they literally. And, you know, Kamala reposted <laughs> Joe Biden's policies, which she's acting like a change candidate. That's I mean, they're the same policies, which Joe Biden continued whose policies for the most part. Donald Trump's who continued mo whose policies for the most part. Barack oh, Obama's who continued whose policies for the most part. George W. Bush. I mean, it's literally just this line of people that like does <clears throat> something that is aesthetically different, but doesn't really change anything. Like people need to understand that both sides are bad doesn't automatically mean I'm trying to hide my allegiance to the other side. If you're actually talking materially speaking, there is a side <laughs> that is good and a side that is bad. I mean, I'm using good and bad colloquially here. I really mean material and immaterial or, or material and I don't know what I'm, uh, the other word that I guess material and idealist like idealism. Yeah. This is all in the realm of idealism. Left and right is all in the realm of idealism. It doesn't matter. Like if you say like this ideal that we need in the world that would be progressive, that would change things for the better, um, that would require class politics. Well, all right. But you are in a group of people that doesn't primarily uh, on any material basis need to say anything about class in order to be what it is that's the problem like in order to be something that changes anything we need to understand power and if we don't we're not going to get anywhere and, and and just i mean that sounds reductive but it's really not because understanding power is somewhat complex like all of these things all of these concerns a version of every concern you hear about racism about um bigotry against trans people or bigotry against gay people or bigotry against, you know, any group of brown people or foreigners or any of that. A version of that concern is real. It's maybe not the one you see uh, because, again, representation, but a version of that is real. It may not be as serious as the concern that you're being shown. It may not be even actually that close to it, but it, a version of it exists and it is real. It's just that that's not the primary problem, and it never will be. We have to concern ourselves with the primary problem, which is that of power. And that's the takeaway. That's always going to be. I mean, you know what? I'm never going to put something out that that's not the takeaway, in fact. <laughs> yes. what, what do you got working on? <clears throat> you have, do you have, do you have anything that you're I'm just working on getting the main channel stuff moving again for now before I sort of nail down what the next documentary is going to be. Um, I also started a band called That Darn Racket, which the pony cover in the documentary is the first song of. Um, so that's the thing I'm doing. Um, I do like the song covers a lot. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. I think the pony one is it's the most feature complete, I guess is the best way to say it. Because <laughs> my brother, who's an actual music producer who is charted on Billboard, um, produced great. it. So it, it doesn't sound like shit. Like most of mine sound like shit. Cause, for free? What's that? Do, you have to pay him. Oh, I had to pay him. <laughs> All right. I didn't have to pay him as much as somebody else would have to pay him, though. Okay. Uh, let's be very clear about that. Okay. okay. Um, I don't have the money that it would cost to pay him like a real <laughs> like artist. Yeah. Also, I'm his brother, so I'm kind of I'm very lucky in that regard. That's um, what I'm saying, yeah. So it's nepotism, but it's whatever. 
Okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's whatever. All right, sure. That's the name of the next documentary. It's that I doesn't, but it's whatever. Yeah. You know, I, All right, I know, you know, I, know the, I know the sibling relationship. I know. Yeah, yeah. But I appreciate you guys for having me on. Like this was a blast. I I would love to do this again as as any time you would be open to it. Oh, this is great. yeah, that's awesome. No, totally. We could just we're gonna we're gonna stay in touch, and you know, I, I, yeah, for anyone absolutely. else watching, you wanna you wanna drop some like uh uh user or like tags or whatever like you know, uh, on like youtube you can on youtube you can find my sort of like shorter like i'm discussing a simple well not a simple but a single topic uh, and i'm trying to keep my scope as small as i possibly can so i don't end up working for a month or three months or eight months on a video um that's youtube.com slash at peter or youtube.com slash peter coffin uh, my documentary channel is youtube.com slash at important D's, uh, as in the letter D and a, an S after it, uh, like docs. Uh, it's a it's a word abbreviation. I, I don't know why I'm explaining abbreviations. <laughs> I, I realize that's absurd. Um, but also you can find me on Twitter at Peter Coffin. Uh, those are my three primary things. I, I do other things, but like I don't think that they're worth talking about other than, oh, oh you can find me at that darn racket on Twitter and on YouTube. So yeah, I'm going to start following that. Yeah. I appreciate it. I mean, there's a lot more to come with that. Uh, the, the covers, I have a few more covers, uh, and I have some songs that are real songs. Uh, but I mean, it's also for somebody who's interested in Marxism, it is not a project that they would care about. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. <clears throat> well, either way, um, I'm just going to put it out there. I think I think everybody needs to see this documentary, not just like communists or Marxists. I think everybody across the across the aisle should I've gotten check a lot this of out. feedback from people who like say, "I normally hate communists, but I don't I, I actually thought this was like there's I've posted a couple of of instances of that. It's been getting a really good response and I'm really appreciating people's input. Yeah, no, it's um I feel like you touch on a central problem that we really, really need to get over, which is why I kept telling people this is an important documentary that you need to fucking watch. I mean, I named the series that for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> important D's. Yeah. Important D's not, I'm not going to say it. Uh, no, no but, I, I, I kind of invite it intentionally with that. Um, obviously, okay. it's called Very Important Documentaries, but I abbreviate it. I'm like, this is going to make people think that. <laughs> yeah. No, it's great. Important. Um but yeah, I feel like this is a problem that we really need to a problem we really need to solve because I don't want to spend the re I don't know about you guys. I don't want to spend the rest of my life fighting these stupid ideological wars while like we slowly turn into as Whitney Webb would put it, uh retarded goblins that are going to eat bugs. <laughs> I think I mean, she referred to. I think uh, she's correct. I think she You can't even we respond to we can't even respond to a fucking hurricane now. No, the response no. to the response to Katrina was better. I'm telling oh, you, absolutely. <laughs> like, it, and I, I hate to say, like, you know, Katrina. I don't want people to think I think that Katrina was good, but wow, no, it wasn't like, good. It's it so it is so much worse now. It is so much worse now. It's just it's, it's only getting worse. Yeah. But yeah. again, guys, thanks a ton. I, I really, this was a great conversation. I love, like, it's very, very good. I like being able to throw the humor around a little more because I go on. He's got ADHD too. So. Yeah, no, it's it, I, it's detected. <laughs> it's never not detected, Greg. That's it's the most detectable thing in the world. You hear a knock in the corner, and all of a sudden you stop mid sentence. And just squirrel over there for a couple minutes. Like <laughs> every nobody can. Anytime I, I don't know about you guys. Anytime I've been like I have ADHD. There's only one response I get from people. I know. Yeah. Like, <laughs> no, I get it too. I love it. See, you can detect the, the the easiest tell is when you start saying something and then you say you know like when and then you say something that doesn't sound like what you would say you know, like when it's like a, just a completely, you just start talking about something and then it takes about an hour, but you do get back to, you know, like I when <laughs> that's, that's the biggest our whole fucking podcast. I, I mean, I did that twice this in this one. Like, I had to work really hard on one of them to even remember what I was talking about. <laughs> yeah. That's the worst. Cause like we do that all the time where we'll be covering a topic 
and then it just veers like so there's no two problem is, veers off the cliff. I'll tell you the biggest problem is that with Marxism, you it's all related. Like it genuinely is all 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 related. So it's very easy to get lost in the sauce, so to speak. It's mm -hmm. it's very easy to be like, well, you know, it's like this because this other thing that I can tell you everything about is if I'm obsessed with it like a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, I should probably stop. Like, could, this is another symptom of ADHD. You continue talking when you've already been like, I should stop talking. <laughs> no, that's that's the best one. I remember, I had, God, I, I I was on one I was on one show, and I'm like, all right, well, thanks everybody for having me. <laughs> and then someone gets in like a little, just a little thing, and I'm like, shit, don't take the bait, don't take the bait. Till, oh, I'm going in. Hour later, I'm like, well, bye. Like, <laughs> you're just like, what did I do for now? What were you talking about? Greenland sharks? What the fuck was that? It's true. It's very true. But, I, you know, this time I'm going to say it and I'm going to be serious about it. <laughs> yeah. I really appreciate you guys. I mean, again, had a blast, um, but I, I do have to go. And, and I hope you guys, whatever you do next week, I'll definitely be paying attention. This is a great show. Awesome. For sure, man. We'll definitely have to have you back to complain about whatever bullshit's going to happen next week because we know it's always a new thing these days. Oh, yeah. And and yet, are. it's always the same thing. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Well, have a good thanks one, Thanks so much. Peace out. Peter Coffin, everybody. Peter Coffin. Thank you. <laughs>